Hello and welcome. If you're here, you're obviously considering buying a Ferrari 308. Now, if you are, the 30 or so videos that I've done on this particular car, the Influenza, are probably the ultimate buyer's guide, but don't let those put you off. I bought this car knowing that it was cheap and that it had a lot of issues. So in this video, um, I'm gonna be telling you, first of all, about the history and model range of the 308, which ones are more or less desirable. Then we're gonna talk about the various things to look out for if you're considering buying one. So in terms of we're going to look at the bodywork we're going to look at the engine and gearbox other mechanicals and the interior i'm going to then take it for a drive and try and tell you as best i can what they are supposed to feel like on the road so that if you drive one you know what to expect and what to look out for and then lastly we're going to have a chat about um, maintenance costs parts costs and values intel once said that no ferrari would ever leave the factory without a v12 However, he soon realized that in order to keep the company afloat, they had to produce cars in bigger numbers. This is how the 206 and 246 Dinos were born. They had a V6 engine designed by Ferrari, but produced in collaboration with Fiat, and they were never badged as Ferraris. Similarly, the 308 GT4 was badged a Dino. This was a car that was designed by Bertone. It had a new flat plane V8 engine, and it was really well received by the press. It was a good car to drive, however, it never sold in big numbers, probably because of the design, which wasn't traditionally very Ferrari looking. So for the GTB and GTS, Ferrari brought the design back in house and Fioravanti produced what is arguably one of the prettiest mid-engine Ferraris ever. There were four main variations to the 308. So first of all, you had the glass fiber cars, Vetro Resina. They were actually made uh, when the car was initially produced in 1975, only 880 of those were produced. That's by far the rarest variant, and they're the ones that are worth the most. Now, you'd think that being glass fibre, they would actually be easier to maintain because you wouldn't get rust, but actually they have a, a steel structure underneath the panels, which tends to rust really badly, and they are extremely expensive um, to restore. After the Vitro Resina cars came the steel-bodied carburetted cars, the first, uh, some of those came with a dry sump engine like the Vitro Resina, but eventually they went to wet sump like this one. From 1980 onwards, the GTSI was launched. That was the first fuel injected 308 and actually power dropped from a claimed 250 to about 210 horsepower. To compensate for it, Ferrari actually changed the gearing. But the GTSIs are probably the least desirable of the 308 range, although they are much easier to live with than the carb cars. Lastly, from 1982 to 1985, the QV was made. That was with a four valve head, and that brought the injected cars back almost on par with the carb cars in terms of pure power. Although I do believe the carb cars were still slightly ahead of the QVs. 308s had tubular chassis, so the actual bodywork is non-structural, which is a good thing. The tubular chassis itself didn't suffer too badly from rot. Um, partly it's covered up by under trays, um, but they can go and you do have to examine them quite carefully. With regards to the bodywork itself, always look at the lower panel. Anywhere below this swage line here is likely to potentially be problematic. Now these look like normal sills, but as mentioned, they are non-structural. They're not that expensive to replace. Um, you can buy whole, the whole panel for about two, three hundred pounds and then labor on top of that, but it's not too horrendous. The bottoms of the doors tend to go and that can be quite expensive to rectify. So do keep a look out for that. At the rear, the actual top of the arch itself, this area isn't too bad because they actually, they have plastic wheel liners. However, have a close look at all these sections underneath these flaps as well, um, as they can go. And also these rear, rear panels here as well um, do tend to, to suffer as well. At the front, there are no wheel arch liners. There was just some stone chip paint. And once that fails, you can start to get bubbles coming through. So check that pretty carefully as well. Overall though, considering the reputation that Italian cars of this age have, I wouldn't say that rust is the biggest problem. You shouldn't underestimate it, but I think the mechanicals are more important. Despite their reputation, the engines are actually quite robust old things. Mine hasn't been, um, but I'm not sure how it's been treated in the past. Um, first thing to look out for is various oil leaks. I mean, most of them do leak, and it just depends how severe it is. 
Um, one of the worst places for them to leak is the cam seals, which can be quite an expensive job. I think if you take it to a, a specialist, it can cost upwards of sort of 1,500 pounds to fix any cam leaks. That's because taking the cam covers off is quite an involved process on one of these and not as simple as, as it is on many other cars. Other places where you could, which you should check, which you get leaks from, is the gearbox shaft actually goes through the engine oil sump before it gets to the gearbox uh, itself. And that first joint there does tend to leak. It's leaking on this car. It does leak on a lot of cars. It doesn't worry me particularly. I think once you replace it, it only lasts a certain amount of time anyway. So expect that to possibly be leaking and for it to be something that would be quite hard to rectify permanently. Both sumps, so that's the gearbox and the engine as well, they, they can leak and they just need to be taken off and resealed properly. Various oil pipes can over time leak and just be careful because some of those may look fairly standard um, but they tend not to be uh, and so they can be, the fittings can be quite specific so something you think you could replace fairly easily can end up being quite expensive. This is a carb engine, and again, the carbs will be more labor intensive to maintain than the injection system. However, on the plus side, for me at least, I understand carbs, and if you're a home mechanic, I think that they are easier to deal with than an injection system. The ignition system, actually, you need to keep an eye on. It, it's just a question of whether it's being maintained properly. So whether it has a single distributor like this car or a double distributor, you just have to make sure that all the leads are in a good state these extenders are notorious for failing but they're all things which are really relatively easy to fix and that will be quite obvious if the car isn't running properly and we'll, we'll see what they're supposed to sound like when we take them for a test drive if when you're driving it you hear any clunks or anything like that then you should be concerned because the suspension can be an expensive area to fix those clunks may come from the anti-roll bar bushes in which case it's nothing too dreadful however the wishbone bushes themselves are welded in and that is an expensive job to do. If there is an issue and those need to be changed, you could be looking at, um, for doing the whole car, um, it could be quite a few hours work, um, plus the bushes themselves. Another area to watch out for, if it has the original shocks, those bushes as well are not an easy fix and they are quite an expensive job to do. It might almost be worth replacing the shocks altogether rather than getting those, those, the, the shock bushes themselves replaced. Another area you should look out for is the steering rack. Now we'll talk about that um, when we're driving, but essentially the, on the passenger side, there's a plastic bush that always wears within 10 or 15,000 miles. So if you have any slack on it on that side, um, then it's certainly coming from that. Now, the bush itself can be still bought from Superformance and it's only about 20 pounds. The problem is the labor and the time in rebuilding it and potential issues mean that quite often the sensible sensible thing to do is to buy another new steering rack. They are available. They're about 500 pounds all in. And in the end, it can end up costing a similar amount to completely rebuilding one of the, uh, the original racks. So bear that in mind. While I absolutely love the way that they look, the interior is not the best part of this car in terms of quality. Um, they're fairly shoddy, but it does have a lot of charm. These old style sort of toggle switches and the heater switches are amazing. In terms of the heating itself on this car, it actually tends to be very hard to adjust. If you have the optional aircon, well, to me, it's a complete waste of time. Maybe if you live in the US, but it's so marginal, even when it's working, that I just don't, I, I don't see the point. And on this car, I've actually removed it because it was just, it was doing so little. It's actually quite a heavy lump and removing it makes changing the belt so much cheaper, quicker and easier. The windows are renowned for moving quite slowly and there are upgrade kits like this car has which make them work like a modern car. They tend to get worse and worse because of the greases used mean that the motors struggle more and more as the grease sort of solidifies. So they can be cleaned up and improved but one of the aftermarket kits will make a huge difference. Another area which you should be looking out for is the fuse box. This car, as you can see, has an upgraded fuse box. This has flat blade um, fuses and is available from, I can't remember where it's available from, but I'll put it in the video description. 
or it will pop up now on screen. Um, but this is something I can't recommend enough. Either just make sure that your original fuse box is kept very clean, cleaned with WD-40, that all the springs are tight. Otherwise, do upgrade to one of these, which are just a huge improvement um, and do definitely help what is one of the weak areas of this car, which is the electrical system. From the GTBSI onwards in the 1980s, the interiors were improved somewhat. So the ridiculous clock and the gearbox temperature, which are hidden behind your knee, were moved to a binnacle here. There were some nicer door cards, different seats. And the interiors on, the, on those later cars, on the injected cars, are actually generally a bit nicer. However, you have the downside that you don't get the lovely original mirrors and you get a different steering wheel. This isn't, by the way, the original wheel. This is one from one of the later cars, which is slightly smaller. But the original wheels are much in demand and make the interior give it a bit of an older sheen as well. The original cars came with 14-inch wheels and metric Michelin tyres. They are still made by Michelin, but they are extremely expensive. I think it's about £2,000 to replace all four corners. The 15-inch wheels, and you can buy reproductions today if your car doesn't have them, make tyre choice much cheaper. Uh, and much more much more affordable having said that I do really love the original look and I do think it suits the car's lines depending on who you speak to having the original wheels and tires is a detriment to the way the car handles or an improvement I think it makes it a little bit more live but even squishier and these aren't the most precise cars at any time um, so for me personally I would definitely keep the 15 inch wheels <laughs> This is now a car designed in the 70s and you do have to realise that when you're driving it. Technically, they're not super accomplished, especially on really twisty roads. But on quite open wide roads, they are an absolute pleasure to drive. Swapping through that gearbox, just one of, the, one of life's pleasures. The flat plane crank V8 has a character all of its own. It doesn't sound anything like a normal V8 and it doesn't sound like the later Ferraris that really sort of wailed. But it has a really appealing little sound and a real character that's just special to these cars. It's a bit like two inline fours running at the same time, which is actually essentially exactly what it is. happily to seven and a half thousand revs that is the whole point of having the flat plane crank is that it's revy a lot of modern vans are probably faster than this car so it's not really about the performance the steering is not particularly quick but the feel the way it feels is just you cannot get that in a, in a modern car when you take yours for a drive make sure that so second gear will always be stubborn when, they, when it's cold and you should probably just completely omit second gear altogether and just go straight from first to third until the car is warmed up. Apart from that, the gearbox should be literally millimeter, millimeter perfect. And indeed, I think the, be the gearbox on this car, on this 308, is probably the best bit of the whole car. It is, it's not the quickest, it's not the shortest throw, but it's the nicest feeling gearbox that I have ever used. There's obviously that Ferrari clack clack, but also it's simply, it's just the way it feels. It's a steel rod going straight to the gearbox and it is one of life's great pressures, it really is. They are prone to misfires uh, in terms of either if the carbs aren't set up properly or if the distributors haven't been kept up to scratch. So just make sure that it is running properly. The parking brake is a complete joke. It just never works on any of these cars. If you can get it to work, it'll almost certainly be dragging to a certain extent. So just Try and adjust it as best you can. 
get it through an MOT. Some people actually adjust it just to get through the MOT and then loosen it off again, but you just can't rely on it. It is absolutely dreadful. They actually ride rather well and there should be absolutely no noises. I mentioned earlier the suspension can be expensive to put right, so when you're driving it, you will get some little clunks. The chassis, especially on the open top ones, it's not particularly torsionally rigid, so you will get some noises coming through, but if there is anything which is like a suspension clunk, then you need to check and see what it is. Likelihood is it'll probably be the anti-roll bar bushes, but if it is, if the other bushes need doing, then you need to be aware of that and budget for that. Steering at parking speeds is really heavy. However, once you get out onto the open road, it lightens up noticeably and it gets that sort of delicacy that only these older cars seem to have. All in all, on a nice summer's day, this is a British summer's day, so it's not that nice, but it is still amazing to be out in an open topped old Ferrari with everything that it sort of gives you. I am six foot one and I just about fit in this. If you're much taller than me, you're really gonna struggle to get comfortable. Um, so again, keep that in mind if you're looking to buy one. You could probably fiddle with the seats a little bit to give you a bit more room, but they are not built for really tall people. A big, big mod, well, an easy, actually a small mod that makes a huge, huge difference is to get a steering wheel space. So I have a five mil, 550 mil one here, but you could actually probably get away with a 25 mil. It just makes it so much better. You can also slightly alter the angle of the wheel. And again, it just makes it more like a normal car as standard. They've got this weird bus driver position. This one used to be really close. Um, to the binnacle there and it was a bit of a pain. So now the big one and that is maintenance costs. You'll be pleased to hear that the 308s are actually some of the cheapest Ferraris that there are in terms of maintenance. You do not have to drop the engine to do the belts. It's very easily they're accessible from the uh, right hand side through the wheel arch. You take the liner out and the belts are there. As I mentioned if the aircon is out it makes the job even easier and quicker. A belt service can be anything from eight to 900 pounds. Depending on who you speak to, that should happen every two years, three years, or five years. I would say on the safe side, between three to four years for the belts is probably okay. The valve clearances in theory have to be done every 12,000 miles. However, this is a bucket and shim arrangement. So the clearances change very, very rarely. And I think that is something that can be kept to a longer range. Most of these are used so rarely anyway that I don't think it's something you need to worry about for a fairly long time in any case. If you do have to do the valve clearances, it is quite expensive because the cam covers have to come off. And as I mentioned previously on this car, that is quite a lengthy process. The actual seals as well that you're gonna to have to use when you put the cam covers back on, they're around hundred pounds or more. So in the end, it's a job that mounts up in terms of cost. If you're looking at spares as well, some of them can be surprisingly cheap. You can get a full set of pads for the whole car for 60 pounds. New discs all round will set you back 550 pounds, which is all really pretty reasonable. Similarly, a clutch will cost you about 750 pounds to replace, which is really quite reasonable for an old performance car, for an old performance Ferrari rather. There are of course some things which can be extremely expensive things that you can't find anymore. These curved rear windows, they are unobtainable and they are a huge amount of money if you should need them. Some of the other bits as well, a lot of them are remanufactured by people like Superformance, which does make it cheaper. I would say on the whole, it's been comparable to running a 911. Some of the later cars that you can get um, from the 355, 348 onwards can be much more expensive to look after than these. Lastly, should you buy one and what should you expect to pay for one of these? Well, should you buy one? I absolutely think you should. I think it's one of the prettiest cars you can get. It has a charm all of its own. It's perhaps not, it's perhaps not the most um, accomplished driving machine in terms of pure dynamics, um, but on the right road, it really has an incredible amount of charm. The Vitro Resina cars are way and above more expensive than everything else. I'd say they're roughly double the price of all the other cars. So you would be looking here in the UK for a good fiberglass Vitro Resina car at about between 130 and 150,000 pounds, perhaps even more. 
Obviously that's justified by the rarity and also to be honest, they are a, a useful 150 kilos lighter. So they do help uh, the way the 308s drive. However, for most of us, they are probably out of reach. The other cars are more usable. They're still not totally usable, I guess, in terms of reliability and in terms of the attention that they attract, but in terms of pricing, they're definitely more attainable. You have the GTB versions, which are the coupes and the GTS. Now, I have seen prices all over the place, depending on which is which. I did think originally that the coupes were worth more, then someone said that the GTSs were more in demand, so I don't know. You're gonna have to look at each specific car on that side because I just can't tell. After the glass fiber car, I think it's between the QVs and the carb cars as to which is most desirable. Both have advantages and disadvantages. The QV has a nicer interior, some nice touches there, and it is a more reliable car than the carb car. On the other hand, you do lose out on the carb sound, and I think that they are, in theory, they do develop slightly less power, but I think it would be hard to notice on the road. After that come the fuel-injected cars, the two-valve fuel-injected cars, the GTSIs. They are the ones that are worth um, the least. So for a good steel-bodied car, again, the dry sumps are probably slightly more desirable, and that would be a GTB, so a coupe. They didn't make a dry sump in the GTS version. Um, but for a dry sump steel car, you would pr probably be looking in the region of £80,000. For a carb steel car, you would be looking around anything really from sort of 50,000, for something usable, anything from 50 to 70, 75,000 pounds. And lastly, for a GTSI, there's some American imports as well. You could pick up a usable car for 45,000, maybe even less than that. I originally paid 34,000 for this car. I have spent, I haven't actually added up how much I've spent on it, but just in parts alone, I think that I've ended up spending about close to 15,000 pounds on it. And I have done 90% of the work myself. So you can, you can kind of work out what the risks are. I would definitely say err on the side of caution, buy the best car that you can, don't go for ultra low mileage cars. They will not be the best driving cars. Get something which has been driven and has been looked after, that's had a lot of maintenance done. Please don't be blinded by the classic Ferrari thing of buying something with great provenance and no miles, unless you just want to put it in your garage and not drive it, because that's the only thing it will be good for. Don't let stories about Ferrari reliability put you off from owning for one of these. If you've always wanted a Ferrari, this is probably one of the most approachable and beautiful looking Ferraris that you can get. Thank you very much for watching.